Welcome to the More Perfect Union, a podcast about the joy we get from American politics, or as we call it, real debate without the hate. I'm Greg Matuzak, a liberal Democrat from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm Cliff Dunn, a Republican from Virginia. I'm DJ McGuire, your conservative Democrat from Virginia. And I'm Kevin Kelton, a moderate Democrat living in California. And joining us tonight is a brand new voice on the More Perfect Union, Rebecca Cushmeyer. Hello, Rebecca. Hi, how are you? Rebecca is a uh, former public health advocate and a blogger who writes about politics and public policy at www.stayathomepundit.com. Rebecca, tell us a little bit about your background in politics. Well, where I am is Kensington, Maryland, just outside of the Beltway, uh, in our very near our nation's capital. And my politics these days, I would call myself an angry liberal crone. Oh, well, <laughs> you'll fit in well here. Um, Rebecca, I, th- I almost joined that party, actually, the angry liberal yeah, crone yeah, party. Really That's crone a party. Yes, I'm going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll have our own Jill platform Stein? in 2020. No, <laughs> I said liberal, <laughs> not idiot. <laughs> She's already fitting in. Cliff? With a quarter million downloads to date, most of which we promise are not our family, The More Perfect (laughs) Union is one of the fastest rising podcasts on iTunes. The More Perfect Union podcast can also be found on iHeartRadio, YouTube, and at our website, moreperfectunionpodcast.com. So we had an interesting week this week. Donald Trump actually getting into uh, international politics with a um, now apparently pre-planned call with uh, the Taiwanese, what is it, prime minister? What do they have over there, DJ? President. Oh, they have the a president. president. How backward president are they? President of Taiwan. Uh, no, they <laughs> also have a prime minister. That's an entirely different issue. And uh, so apparently this call was was at least uh, weeks, if not months, in the making. Who, who's been following this story? Um, Taiwan's elected president uh, called the president-elect. Normally Taiwan's presidents don't do that because they don't expect the call to be returned. The surprise was that the call was made and that Donald Trump took the call. Um, he said some nice things. They talked about, you know, various things that presidents talk about and such. Um, <laughs> and that essentially got everyone upset because, again, normally this call is not made and this call is not taken. Yeah. Do you think that Trump knew that he was breaking protocol or do you think that his his staff wanted to do this and he was sort of in the dark about what the implications were? I think the second choice that you gave is far more likely uh, and is far more dangerous because his first response to this was to say essentially, oh, it wasn't me, she called me, as if to assume that that somehow made it all better and made it no longer his fault. I think his staff certainly had an agenda. And even though I like the agenda personally myself, I don't like a staff, a presidential staff and a president having different agendas because that never ends well for them or us. Cliff, what do you think? Yeah. I find it hard to believe that his staff would set him up that way. You know, I, I, I don't think it was an intentional setup, but I do have to wonder if a ball got dropped somewhere in there that, you know, that somehow someone failed to brief him properly. That This does occasionally happen. I like the agenda. And the thing is, in line with the fact that he has on several occasions raised the prospect of tweaking China in various ways, the idea that he would have, you know, would, would would have gone for this was not really surprising to me. The other thought is that those tweets were uh, instinctual damage control on his part. Okay, but I'm still I'm struggling with the idea that his staff didn't tell him that we don't take calls from Taiwan. I mean, I think there's we we can't discount the idea that um, he has business interests in Taiwan or incipient business interests in Taiwan, and uh, he might have wanted to take that call for the same reason he was taking calls from the president of Argentina. The other thing is I've I've heard some murmurs from from people around town that um, he has no attention span. And, uh, he, you know, he's been asking for thinner and thinner briefings when he does get presidential briefings. So it's possible he just did not pay attention when people were talking to him. I agree with Rachel. His foreign policy experience is really, really thin. And I honestly believe that someone said, hey, we've got a president. And he goes, oh, really? And they said, from where? And he said, Taiwan. And he goes, I'll put him through. This sounds important. And I don't think he surrounds himself with people. He, I know he says he puts him, he surrounds himself with the best people. But I don't know if that's necessarily true, especially with, and I, this could be a great segue, some of his cabinet picks. Um, as we've seen, they're not always the most capable and they're not the best experienced. And I don't think that it was just – I think it was just a giant ball drop, and now they're just trying to justify it. I'd also like to point out the fact that 
while everybody's making point of, well, there's this possible real estate deal in Taiwan, the uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China is currently a renter in Trump Tower. That's right. Well, I find myself in the amazing position of being on Donald Trump's side for the first time, I think, uh, oh. since he started running for president. I don't think that this was a mistake. I think that Trump knew exactly what he was doing. I think he played it really badly in the press. And, you know, last week I thought that maybe he was so dim-witted that he didn't understand what he was doing. But this week, with a little bit more information, I think that this was, in his mind, a cagey way of tweaking the Chinese and trying to show them that American foreign policy in Asia is going to change very quickly under a Trump administration. Well, and I tried to hint at that with what I was mentioning about um, the the tweets being the issue where he saw the blow up and immediately tried to back off. Not that he was uninformed previously, but I think it's fair to say we, that, that there, there's a pattern of he as soon as something blows up, he immediately starts trying to maneuver around it. Yes. Well, and I think yes. he's used to a certain amount of anonymity. He, you know, he can, he for however many years has been conducting business without the constant uh, scrutiny of the press. So the fact that this phone call was was public knowledge probably surprised him. He, he has grown up and been a real estate developer in New York City. Uh, the notion that you can be anonymous in New York City is just not uh, – it, it's not plausible. Um, he, but I don't think that, you know, that, I don't think that New- we're, we're aware of every phone call that private citizen Donald Trump made in the way that we are going to be aware of every phone call that – President Donald Trump makes. And those are the first time that, that I've used those words, by the way. <laughs> I also have to wonder if this is maybe something of a misdirection because I'm also seeing reports that he's going to put Iowa Governor Terry Branstad as the ambassador to China. Now, Terry Branstad and Xi Jinping, who's the current blood on his hands butcher running China right now, they were old friends from back in the day when Xi Jinping was just a little princeling trying to figure out how to be a corrupt dictator and all. And um, <laughs> Where are you going I honestly think, that? yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I think the fact of the mat, this may very well be a situation where he says, you know, uh, or at least people around him say, you know, go ahead and make the phone call, get everybody, get everybody all freaked out, and then when you appoint Terry Branstad and make Beijing really, really happy, nobody notices. I wouldn't rule that out either. Now, talking about uh, appointing people to uh, various positions in his administration, and somebody made a reference to this, there have been several new names floated this week. We know that Ben Carson is going to be nominated for HUD secretary. We already know that James Mad Dog Mattis is going to be at defense. Steve Mnuchin at Treasury. Michael Flynn is the National Security Advisor to be. And there's been a new name or two floated for the State Department this week. Greg, did you hear the name John Huntsman brought up? No, no, oh, not God, at all. Oh, God, yes, please, John Huntsman, please, please. <laughs> I like John Huntsman. As, as, I mean, I can, I can stomach that to some degree, but I can't see him actually picking John Huntsman and say, I mean, it just won't happen. Well, he, he's, no. he's good. At, he either met with him today or is going to meet with him, and his name has been floated by the Trump team. So here's my question for everybody. We all probably think that John Huntsman is a capable man who would probably be the best or among the best of the names floated so far. Didn't Donald Trump spend the last year talking about how incompetent the current administration has been with China and specifically saying that we don't have anyone who negotiates at the level that the Chinese negotiate? And wasn't John Huntsman the ambassador to China for the first three or four years of the uh, uh, yes. of the Obama first administration? First two years. Okay, was two first years. two years. So what and then he ran say? in the 2012 primaries. Yes, I know right. that. But, but but how can Trump criticize uh, the, uh, well, the Obama easily. administration's handling of China and then turn to the ambassador of China to possibly be his new uh, secretary I, of state? I have- Theory. I have a theory on that. One, he, because he's courting Romney, and Romney hates Huntsman. That's a well-known fact. They hate each other. And I think he said, well, okay, well, you know, if I'm not going to have you, I'll pull in Huntsman to come and maybe take your job. They are well-known. Uh, Huntsman was uh, well-known to get the Olympics. Things weren't pulling through. Romney swooped in at the last minute and organized it and took all the glory they hate each other so yeah 
I think that's what it is. I think it has nothing to do. With Huntsman is not getting the job. It's just a ploy to get Romney. So this whole presidency is just a well, soap well, opera and, for Donald Trump to play with people's heads. Uh, well, and I, I would year, also is, and the I, last year was meant to play with my head. <laughs> yes, it's just my head. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I am I am chalking this up to the overly active rumor mill surrounding cabinet appointments that have been floating around, and I'm not giving it that much credibility until something actually comes of it. Yeah, it came from anonymous sources, and you know, it, it's there. There've been a parade of people, and there was another name that I saw that surprised me that they say is now shortlisted for state. But I, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, we're going to see Bob Corker get it. Yeah. That's that's my my random prediction. He's chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. That's where Hillary came out of. That's where Biden came out of. He's he's eminently qualified. He's totally confirmable. And uh, I think that's who Paul Ryan and Rents Priebus will want. And he's got nice white well, hair. Well, well, yeah. And you really would... have to have nice hair. Don't you? Yeah. I mean, Trump. Well, why would the you? Rest have... of us <laughs> why would you say the words qualified with the words Trump cabinet? And I mean that. <laughs> Ben Carson for HUD? I mean, seriously. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but, I mean, you, you got to list. You know, silos, fill them with grain. They'll be pyramid yeah. shaped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think James Mattis is qualified. Um, Elaine Chow is definitely qualified. Um, HUD is always a sort of throwaway department that, uh, you know, gets whoever right, gets well, it and nobody really cares or notices. James Mattis um, is qualified, but he do, he's legally not qualified. Yeah, he's not, he, he, needs, he a needs a waiver. But yeah, can we, wait, can we explain that for our other... audience? He is a, a, yeah. a former general, but he has only been a former general for about three to four years. And there is a clause, uh, I don't know whether it's, I don't think it's in the Constitution, but there is a law someplace that says that uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense shall not be a part of the... Uh, of the military and therefore must be at least seven years removed from any active military duty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. luck getting that through again, <laughs> that waiver. Which, by the way, and I That's will just... say this honestly, well, if this was Hillary Clinton and she wanted to appoint him, I'd be against it for that exact same reason. I do not believe that military people should be running the Pentagon. It should be run by civilians. I disagree on that. Well, okay, here's, I, okay, I, here's the reality. Here's the reality. It doesn't matter who is the Secretary of Defense. Military people run the Pentagon anyway. The the greater issue, however, one, I actually think the Carson appointment is a problem. Um, Samuel Pierce, if they may remember, ended up very badly staining the Reagan administration during his tenure. He was deeply corrupt, uh, or he became deeply corrupt. Do you, you see Carson see, as corrupt? Uh, not right now. Come back to me in 2019. Now, talking about what's coming in the uh, Trump administration, we saw another little glimpse of that uh, this past week with the, the carrier deal in Indiana. DJ, uh, you had some some thoughts on that lovely bit of, of executive action. On one level, this is the sort of thing they do in banana republics. You get a call from the president, and the president says, nice little company you have there it would be a shame if something happened to it. Do you really want to do X? Don't you really want to do Y instead? That's the just the first initial reaction. When you look at what is actually happening, um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism just from the from the abstract perspective and that this gets in the way of the free market, that it's industrial policy writ small. But there are genuine consequences of this sort of thing. Investors will look at this and they will think twice about putting their money into the United States of America again, because once you do, you essentially put your company at the whim of of Donald Trump. And if Donald Trump doesn't like what you're doing, he can seriously affect your bottom line. And the best way to avoid that is to avoid investing in the United States of America. And with this particular action as well, yes, Carrier is now going to do certain production in Indiana instead of in Monterey. Well, if you're in Texas or Arizona or California or even Colorado, you know, Monterey was closer to you than Indiana. So you're now going to pay higher shipping costs. And given that, I think most of carriers' customers are either commercial or in construction. That means those areas, those firms where the, where carrier has customers, they're going to hire fewer people wherever they are because they have to deal with higher shipping costs from northern Indiana instead of northern Mexico. The unintended consequences of this will continue to roll on and roll on. And that's one of the reasons why so many Republicans used to appreciate 
that intervening in the free market is not something you do on a normal basis. Okay. But the reaction from Paul Ryan, the reaction from Mike Pence shows that the Republican Party is now very fine with big government so long as it helps people who look like they do. This is the continuing transformation of the Republican Party into the party of big government for white people. Okay, that was an economic explanation that I think we all followed, but there's a real <laughs> there's a real world political implication to what happened. Greg, you live in that neck of the woods or close to it. I do. What do you, I mean? I, do. I mean, it, DJ told us look, why it's we, bad from an economics perspective. What do you think from a political perspective? Look, our our local uh, Ford plant closed. Uh, and I remember being brought out and they made the announcement at the high school saying, Hey, all of your parents' jobs are gone. And my father didn't work there, but everyone I knew, they called it and they said, Hey, everyone who, who goes to school here, everyone. And they, they did this over the announcement. So we didn't have to go to home and find our parents crying. And I know what it's like when an entire town loses like their plant you know source yeah. yeah their plant i mean it's crushing okay and then to have a president call and by the way this is, there will be a twist because it sounds like i'm defending donald trump but i'm not <laughs> um you know because it sucks it sucks and we had that with dhl this year uh two years ago up in dayton we've had that with several car companies we've had this you know year company after company in this area no matter how great John Kasich is in Ohio, in Indiana, in Kentucky, uh, plant after plant after plant close. And all those kids at high schools get that announcement. It sucks. It sucks for families. It sucks everywhere. But at the same time, you can't have the president call every time and say, I'm going to get this open maybe what half the jobs and it was oh, middle even. management it was right it was a it was a 800 jobs and it was mostly management it wasn't even the factory well let me ask I you mean, about that because i've heard it, somebody on on on, uh, on open fire our political group somebody said that these were all management jobs why would they be moving managers to to mexico i, I don't understand this what happened there i have no idea to be quite honest but even still um at what point do you just blackmail or do you tell every company you can't leave because of it's a bad, bad precedent? It's, you know, it's not the way to run a country, you know? And, well, and you know what? Point, One thing that's right. telling and, and, and really worth noting in all of this is that Mike Pence is the governor of Indiana. These maneuvers to, you know, offer tax benefits or, or some sort of incentive to keep companies in a particular state are not new. Governors have been doing this fears. I remember, I remember it happened when I lived in Ohio. I remember uh, there, there was some interplay between whoever the governor of Ohio was at the time, and I'm blanking on who it was, and the governor of Kentucky, because it was like a Honda plant was threatening to pull up stakes in Ohio and move to Kentucky, and Ohio wanted to keep it. Um, Rebecca, so what, of, year, what year was that? Do you remember the year? Uh, oh, one or oh, two. That would have been Bob Taft. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, oh, God, but, I hate Bob Taft. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my God, I hate Bob Taft. I, I, I just remember I, it was Kenneth just Blackwell who was the problem while John I was Kasich. there. Oh. John Kasich. Um, but yeah, th th this has generally been the purview of governors, and I think you know probably in a lot of ways it was it was a Mike Pence kind of thing to do with with Donald Trump coming in, you know, to to run the victory lap on this, and he can't really do that in every state. Well, you know, are... he doesn't have a VP who's a sitting governor in every state. No, but there are about but thirty to thirty two GOP governors across the country who would probably be very pliable well, you know, to be, a president, right. a Trump, uh, if he said, what can you do in your state to keep such and such a plant there? They're going to try to find tax breaks to do it if he asks them to. Yeah, but, and, but whenever and, and there's Trump a tax already... break, someone has to pay for it. It's, yeah. it's, it's not just going to come out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay. It's going to come well, from yeah, but middle today, class. It's going to come from... To, to today, to, to, to today's tax credit that saves X amount of jobs becomes next year's ridiculous loophole that needs to be closed because the, the legislature has other spending priorities. And right. over and above that is you're essentially going to have, if the president is, you know, your Donald Trump has made it very clear now that he is going to enjoy playing 
presidential whack-a-mole going to each state with their little <laughs> beggar thy neighbor policies. Well, at the same time, he's also made it very clear that if you, you know, that he will find some way to slap a 35% tariff on you if you leave the country. There was a term during, during FDR's administration called a capital strike, where folks just basically said, okay, if that man is going to continue doing this kind of thing, we just won't invest. And it helped cause the 1937-38 recession. You are going to see, I believe, I genuinely believe, this is the kind of behavior that will lead to a capital strike in this country in 2017 and 18 and 19. Uh, you mentioned a recession, DJ, and that just gives me one other thing that I wanted to throw into the show before we move on, which is, you know, we, we've had eight years of growth. Now, it's been very slow growth in this country. Obviously, the the recovery has not been as robust as anyone would have wanted it to be. But eventually, within the next year or two, there's going to be a recession. And I guarantee you it will be dubbed the Obama recession, no matter who causes it. And it will be blamed on President Obama. And it will be blamed on the Democrats in the House and the Democrats in the Senate. You just watch. Okay, with that, uh, I thought it'd be fun to give Rebecca a chance to learn a little bit about us and maybe give our audience a chance to learn a little bit about us, too, with a new segment that we're going to call Name That Host. So, Rebecca, are you ready to play Name That Host? I, I hope so. Okay. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to score this. Uh, you get five points for each right answer. Which of our hosts... Do I get Carl Castle's voice on my home answering machine if I win? <laughs> Whoever that is, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Rebecca. What? I'm a liberal. I listen to NPR. I was going to say... <laughs> what Boy, you do? I didn't know the name. Spot the liberal. Spot the liberal Spot on that one. That's a, that's a game we'll play next week. Spot the liberal. Um, Rebecca, which of our hosts <laughs> is currently a Girl Scout leader? Oh. Is it Kevin... Is it DJ? Is it Cliff? Or is it myself, Greg? I'm going to say it's Greg. Oh, it's definitely me. I think think there was something in your voice (laughs) that gave it away. Yes, Greg, you are a Girl Scout leader of how of what? What's the name of your troop and how many are in there? It's it's a it's a uh, brownie troop. It's uh, troop four nine seven oh nine. The fighting four nine seven oh nine. There are 13 girls in it. They are rough and they will cut you. They will (laughs) cut you. I, 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 actually, my son is a Cub Scout, and he literally will cut himself every time he gets uh-oh. his hand on his pocket knife. So he'd fit in. <laughs> well done, Rebecca. You got five points there. Let's see if you can double your score. Amongst this hardy group, Rebecca, whose favorite sport is bungee jumping? Maybe you, Kevin. <sighs> Maybe not. Maybe not. not. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> Try again. Uh, go with Cliff? Yep. Ding, ding, ding. Yep. How many times have you bungee jumped that it's your favorite? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, myself. I'm somewhere around 70 or 80 at this point. Holy Good Are you God. kidding me? No. Where does one go to How bungee jump that frequently? <sighs> Ottawa, Whistler, Brit- British Columbia. Uh, there's one, at, one in Kentucky, uh, not far from Lexington. Uh, California, and then... Just after Christmas, I am going to Australia. And do you do it and like where they the... have it tied to your your ankle and you go upside down, or do you do it in a, a whole harness thing? Uh, I've done both. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Okay. I'm kidding. Really hmm. fascinating. Uh, <laughs> let's try again. Uh, which of our... I kind of suck at this game. No, you're doing yeah, great. You're say. doing great, because I'm just making these up. Uh, which of oh, our... okay. Well, then. Um, which of our uh, hosts is a third degree black belt in something called Kempo Karate? Oh, that's you. Yeah, that's me. I gave it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, because you were posting all these throwback pictures of yourself on Facebook doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I want people to be afraid of me so they don't mess with me. So, <laughs> okay, moving on. In your princess headphones. In my princess headphones. Our our listeners don't know what that is, but I wear these very feminine red headphones when we do the podcast. They're not. Um, You just have to get over it. (laughs) (laughs) We call it gender fluid now. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Gender fluid listening devices. Which of our hosts once caused an international flight to emergency land? I'm actually wondering if it's me. No, it isn't me. Um, (laughs) uh, Greg. It was me. It was me. And it's it's a long, super long story. 
but uh, I I threw out my shoulder after a, a giant seizure on my way to Tokyo, and uh, they wouldn't let me throw it back in, like pull a Mel Gibson. And after about like four hours of a dislocated shoulder, um, there's more to it than that. Um, and screaming and shouting and uh, the pilot going, you think you can make it like another like 12 hours uh, <laughs> with a dislocated shoulder? I was like, uh, how much? I, and I kept saying, so where do you guys keep the drugs on the plane? And they were like, uh, we really don't. I was like, no. So they wouldn't, you know, share their secret drug stash. And uh, so they said, I think we'll have to land. And then I got booed by everybody after they saw like this giant swollen arm. Where did you and, land? Uh, which... Where was the emergency landing? <laughs> it was in uh, Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> So wait, you were, on a, you were on a trip to, to Asia and you had to land in Portland, out, Oregon? I, was, I didn't even make it out of the country. <laughs> and uh, and the first thing I said to the guys, I was in so much pain. And I said, I really hope you've got like some drugs. And they said, and the guy had such a great sense of humor. He said, say hello to my friend Morphine. And I said, <laughs> I said hello, yeah. Morphine. <laughs> and um, the, only, the only best part about the story was... Um, I, I knew no one in, in I was I knew nobody in Portland and uh, I just got my shoulder put back in and they just kept giving me morphine throughout the day and I was high I mean I was like <laughs> super high and um, they gave I think me a that's prescription the law in for, Portland like, I know they gave me a prescription for like more drugs and they sent me out and I was I, I had nothing I didn't even have clothes I had like the small backpack and I hit a taxi and they driver's like where do you want to go i was like i need a i need a pharmacy so i can get more drugs and a hotel room and he's like <laughs> and he's like i want to party with you cowboy <laughs> <laughs> that's how all the best stories start <laughs> yeah. and it was and that's what i did i did that for another day and then i flew the rest of the way to uh wow. tokyo after like spent like three days on painkillers high out of my brains legally kids if you're listening totally legal <laughs> and with but, that uh, <laughs> but a bump well with that we want to thank everybody for listening we want to thank rebecca for joining us today please like us on facebook at uh, facebook.com slash more perfect union podcast and share our link on your facebook timeline so your friends can discover us as well and until next week stay warm don't bungee jump out of anything that's moving and <laughs> Ta-ta! I have nothing witty to say this week. I'm so sorry. I need a drink. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry,